where we're talking about that rescue story, he hasn't given up on any of us. This right here to tell us right here. He hasn't given up on anybody in the world, not a single person. So if we want to recite 2 Chronicles 7 14, and my people who are all in my name, humble themselves, pray to see my face, and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from God, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Alright. To the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible. God's holy word. I will make a way out of my feet, and a light out of my path, and I'll hide the sword of my heart, but I might not sin against God. Pledge to the flag of the United States of America. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. Pledge allegiance to the Christian flag, to the Savior, and the kingdom of sins. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. You may be seated. We have that opportunity in that rescue story every day. We need a, sometimes we need that little bit of rescuing. And He is there for that. He is not going to turn you away. All He wants you to do is call on His name. And that's exactly what He will do. Um, Brother Brent, would you mind praying for our country and for Israel as well? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather here in your house to praise you. Lord, please ask for protection for Israel, your chosen people. Lord, they're surrounded by people who hate their very existence. But please ask you to place a hedge protection around them. Lord, we ask you to pray for our leadership in this country. May they bow their knees and understand that uh, it's your will and not theirs. That uh, we need to turn back to you. We've turned our backs against you and we walk away from you. As a nation, Lord, we just need to repent and just uh, realize that your principles is what this country does not belong. And that all of our leadership, from our mayor to our president, understand your word and understand that your way is the right way. Lord, we just ask you to bless Pastor Carter as uh, he delivered the message today. Watch over him. Bless uh, this church, the church of the Lord. Keep us all safe, healthy, and keep us on a path of righteousness and praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I asked Pastor if we could make a short presentation this morning. Um, I, if you look at these feet up here, these feet have walked where Jesus has walked. Amen. We just got back from Israel here a, a few weeks ago, and we finally got all together here to. Uh, have a little discussion with you, and uh, I just wanted to tell you, uh, we all take from Israel our particular spiritual memories, uh, but the one I want to share with you this morning was that I learned, was as we're traveling through the Holy Land, um, I, I noticed that the Garden of Gethsemane is literally across a short valley from the door that Jesus was walked through to pay the price for your life. And I caught myself wondering, did he, uh, did he look at that door when he was bowing for you? Because he knew he was going to be on the cross. Did he, he look at that door thinking of you right now, bowing, bowing and praying and battling that night before he was arrested and taken through that door and hung on the cross. So uh, we felt like uh, we wanted to bring home a little bit of Israel for you guys. So uh, we have, we will be giving you here in a, a minute or two, some crosses that are made in uh, Bethlehem. They are made from olive wood that has been grown and uh, uh, processed in Israel. And uh, you look at this cross, I want you to remember what I told you this morning. Jesus was on the Garden of Gethsemane by life for you. Amen. Yeah. And I, I, it's not very big. Uh, it says Jerusalem on it. You know, it's a trinket. But it's a little meaningful, more meaningful than that. Uh, this is his life shed for you. Okay? So, uh, you want to raise your hands up? We'd like to... Well, we just wanted to let you guys know we were praying for you guys while yes, we were there. Yes. We were thinking of you while we were there. Just wanted to come back to our church family. And we were we were very blessed to have a, a, a simple meal with a Palestinian family, mm -hmm. Christian family over there, 
and they said, you know, when you lift up Israel, it's going to lift us up too. Yes. So they were very, I think they were kind of astounded when we told them, we pray for you every week. Yeah. yeah. And so we thought, we pray for you guys every week, we'll, we'll bring a little bit of Israel back to you guys. Yeah. Bethlehem. Yeah. Bethlehem has the largest concentration of Christians in it, and it's literally only 8%. I mean, not Jerusalem. Not Jerusalem. Bethlehem. 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 I mean, yeah. Where Jesus was born. Where Jesus was born has the largest concentration of Israel of Christians, and it's only eight percent. Wow. Something else I want you to know: these things come from near, very near where he was born. Yeah. It's called the Church of Annunciation, and so it's 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 produced. They told us we went to the factory actually, and it's produced right there yeah. in Bethlehem. So, yep. So, with that, we'll pass yeah. things out. Good luck. us to go to prayer. They have 17 students and they filed their constitution. They're, a, they're going to be a legitimate entity on that college campus. Amen. However, the college campus said that uh, before they allow this, they want them to be inclusive. Their constitution follows scripture and they want everyone to be allowed to join their club or sorority, whatever they call it. So, uh, the battle is on. Radio Christie has lawyers. They're in contact with the American Center for Law and Justice, Jay Seculo. And they're going to take them to court. And eventually they will win in the court. But he's asking for prayer. 15 out of the 17 people that have stand up have found Jesus there. Amen. So his ministry is working. And it is a high-toned ministry. You know, a lot of deep theological thinking. So I, and I know you are, am proud to be part of his ministry. Amen. He's reaching souls and he's intelligently talking to people. And they're getting it. But now the college is trying to block it. So keep them in prayer for that. Oh, and one other thing. They're expecting a little girl in March. Amen. So uh, he blames his uh, daughter because his daughter prayed for his little sister. <laughs> Not sure that's how that works, but okay. <laughs> Don't forget the last Sunday of this month, wear your t-shirt. We want a group picture. Or bring it. Or bring it. And put it on. Who said that? Yeah. Bring it. And we'll put it on to take the group picture. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take the group picture and send one to Miss uh, Esther. And the kids. And the kids, yeah. Trunk or treat is the 31st. We had a blast last year. It was sprinkling, but we had a blast. And everybody got into it. So bring your cars, park over in the parking lot with us. We'll get Christian music playing. We'll have the little tent things up. Decorate your trunks. That's what I was going to say. Decorate your trunks, bring your lights. Let's have a good time. And, and we've got tracks to pass out and candy and tell these kids about Jesus a little bit. 
So it'll be it'll be fun. Um, let me see. November nineteenth, calling all crafters and bakers, those that are willing to donate baked goods for the uh, auction on November nineteenth. Um, I know that there will be folks that will buy them. There's folks with sweet tooths. So they'll be buying those up specially for their Thanksgiving dessert, for the dinner. And this money is, is evangelistic money. We're going to start throughout this year to create a slot in our treasury for evangelism, which goes hand in hand with next year. When we go out and we uh, spread the good news for the harvest. You know, a couple of things that we may even look at buying is a couple more of those little pop-up, what do you call those? And things or something to that effect. We ran short doing some evangelism. You know, we can use them over there for the Pass the Blessing and for the Popcorn Festival and for VBS. So keep that in prayer. And on the 20th, the night after that, we're going to have the CD Praise Night. So it'll be a great time as we worship our God. Okay, with that said, we're going to talk about holiday happiness after, after we're done with the invitation, so hang around for that. I have two jokes for you today. Uh -oh. Yeah, one is, from, one is from my grandson, so it didn't need approval from my kids. How do you fix a broken pumpkin? With a pumpkin patch, that's absolutely right. And the other joke is this. Can you name the four-man rock group that's famous that cannot sing? Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore. <laughs> uh, like it or not, they're not stopping. Okay, we're going to talk about spiritual tests today. How many of you remember last week when we talked about the value of trials and the mechanics of the trial and how to be successful in the trial and how fresh worship was a big part of that to give you strength to get through the trial and the choices that you make. All right. When you were in school, after learning the lesson that the teacher taught for a month on whatever subject that it may be, what always came next? A test. A test. That's right. It's no different for a spiritual trial. It's no different about learning the lesson that God was teaching you. At the end of that lesson, when you walk through the testimony door and received it as a prize, there's always a test. Got to see, they wanted proof that you got the lesson. Same thing here. They wanted proof that you were strong enough to move on. This is vital because it goes hand in hand with trials and spiritual warfare. So let's challenge ourselves to look at tests in a different way. When I was a kid, I was pretty good at school, but tests freaked me out. When I knew they were coming, I was worried about them, I was anxious about them. I could hardly breathe when I was going to go through this test. And, and it just, it caused a fear in me which paralyzes me. And I never, to my thinking, did as good on the test as I should have because I knew the lesson. And one of the reasons was is that fear was in my brain when I was taking the test. If we talked about the lesson, I could tell you it just didn't come. How many of you feel that way? Or am I just alone? Okay, well, we've got three or four. Taking the test was a way of proving that you knew the lesson. Let's highlight some good things that come from spiritual tests so that we, we don't have that fear, that we have an excitement to pass the test. And the first thing that we learn is from spiritual tests is that it demands great sacrifice. If you want to pass the spiritual test, it's going to be a sacrifice. Sacrifice is worship. 
God needs to know that you belong to him. He needs you to know that you belong to him. Okay, so it takes great sacrifice. In most cases, on the human, humanity side of life, no one would volunteer to sacrifice. You know, it's like the old army joke, everybody's lined up in the, the line, and the commander comes and says, I need a volunteer for a mission, and everybody but one guy steps back. So God teaches us how to and the results of sacrifice in our walk through these tests. The Hebrew word for tested means to prove the quality of. It does not mean to entice you to do wrong. See, and that's, that's one of the misconceptions. Well, I, I flunked this test. I don't know why God put this in me. I don't know why he would entice me to do wrong. I failed because he stumbled me. I've heard that so many times. No, the meaning of a test is to prove the quality of the lesson that you learn. That's why God gives us tests. So let's take, we got another misconception coming up in just a minute, but let's take Genesis 22, 1 and 2. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Morah and offer him there as a burnt, sacrifice, a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So a little background as we learn the point that we need here. Abraham was called by God. And, and give him the promise to make him father Abraham. But Abraham messed up. Several times. He messed up when he lied about his wife and said it was his sister to the Pharaoh. <clears throat> he messed up when God promised him a child and decided to figure it out on their own because they didn't wait for him. They didn't want to wait for him. So forth and so on. And the reason I'm telling you this is that this test that God was doing to him was, was called for. He wasn't perfect and he made mistakes. But there needed to be a test for proof. I know I'm not perfect either. I know that shocks some people. <laughs> but we get tested as well. God used this event as a test to affirm the character of Abraham's faith. Now here's the misconception that I want to clear up when it comes to tests. He wanted to prove Abraham's faith. God didn't need that proof. He knows our hearts. Right? He knows your heart. He knows my heart. He knows or he wouldn't have called you to do what you're going to do. He knows that you have it in you. So the proof that we're talking about through these tests is not to prove it to God, but to prove it to yourself. And that's important. You need the affirmation of passing this test to know that you have learned the lesson. Because you need the ability to draw it out on faith, by command, when God requires it of you. Spiritual warfare is a real-time thing. And in that moment in time when the battle is on and God is requiring faith of something that you learned from the trial and that you pass the test, you have the confidence and the working knowledge that you can pull it out and use it when God wants to. How do you know that? Because he proved it to you when you passed that test. God was asking Abraham here to demonstrate that he was as committed to him as pagans were committed to their gods. But it wasn't to demonstrate it to God, it was to demonstrate it to himself. That he had the ability by faith to follow God even if it caused the greatest sacrifice ever. And it was that moment in time that it went from a knowledge here, and this is going to be the theme today, to a working knowledge here. And I'm going to explain that in just a minute. But that's what tests do. 
They give you the confidence to change it from knowledge to working knowledge. Amen. Spiritual tests prove our character of faith to ourselves. When I go through a trial, when I go through something, and something that was devastating to our family, when I go through it, and I get to the other end, and then God tests me for it, and I pass that test, I know I got it. It's transferred from here to here, and I can use it by faith. I can step out on faith when God requires me to do so. If you have it here and you don't have it here, you're not able in real time in spiritual warfare to step out on faith. Because you don't have the working knowledge of it. Spiritual warfare happens in real time. Deuteronomy 8, 2 says, Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. So who's got to know that? You do. God already knows it. There's nothing that we hide from our God. Amen. You got to know that you got the faith to keep His commands in real time spiritual warfare. In times when things are going on and you're going to have to step out and you're going to have to stand for your God when society doesn't want you to in that heat of that moment and God is requiring you to do that, to be that light, to be that servant, to be obedient. You can say, I have the confidence to do this because I just passed that test once before. But if you never pass the test, you're never going to step out. The knowledge is stuck here. And it's not here. Second thing, spiritual tests give us opportunities for choice. 1 Kings 3, 5 says, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. God asked him, what should I give you? Testing always leads to choices. Just like on a test from school, A, B, C, or D, testing always leads to choices. You can identify a spiritual test by the cross crossroads of choices that you're going to have to make. And it usually follows one of two ways. You either follow human logic and what you think you can do to accomplish the goal, or you'll follow God logic when there's nothing there and step out on faith. Hebrews 11 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. Hebrews 11 6 says, You cannot please God without faith. Why is that? Because you're not going to do what He wants you to do when He wants you to do it. You know you can do it. You know it's in God's work, but you don't have the working knowledge. The confidence of the spiritual test never came here. Because you failed the test. Do we ask at this moment in time for God's wisdom? And for God's will to be done in our life and pass the test using God's logic? Or do we follow our own logic by telling God how we want things to end? What we expect from God. Disciples of Jesus Christ are ineffective today because they don't have the faith to stand. They don't know their word. They have never turned God's word from here to here. You can know God's word, but not know God's word. You can have knowledge of what God says, but not working knowledge of that. Why? Because you don't have the confidence to step out. And the reason you don't have the confidence to step out is because you can't pass the spiritual test that God has given you. And one of the reasons you can't is because you don't have this to draw on. Serving God means giving of yourself, all of yourself. It means becoming a student for the rest of your life of God's Word. It means willingness to step out on faith when you don't see the end results. It means a willingness that you're willing to sacrifice whatever God has called you to sacrifice to be obedient to Him. Amen. A spiritual success of a spiritual test will give you the right attitude in serving God. Failing that test will give you the wrong attitude. 
And what we do we say about attitudes? Attitudes. Come on, you can know what to do. I know it's a, is it in cursive? Is that the problem? <laughs> Let's try it again. That's right. How true. Look at the third thing the spiritual tests do for us. The spiritual test gives us hard tasks to complete. They do. The greatest lessons I've ever learned in my life has cost me something. Has made me suffer. Because I won't forget it. Look at John chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. <clears throat> now I want you to watch this. Boy, I, just, I was eating this up this summer, and I'm just eating it up again. I just want you to watch this. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, Oh, Philip, here comes your test. Where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. You think Jesus needed Philip to answer that question, to complete the ministry? No, he knew what he was already going to do. But there is a test involved for Philip. They said, hey, Philip! Yeah, got a big crowd coming. How are we going to feed them all? And Philip goes, uh... Listen, Philip is one of the apostles. Philip's been with Jesus. Philip knows Jesus is the Son of God. Philip has seen miracles. Philip knows as he walks with him every day, you can't help but know, know who Jesus is. But Jesus wants to know if that knowledge is in here or if it's in here. He wants to know if it's just head knowledge or it's a working knowledge that you're willing to step out on faith. The correct answer should have been... God logic and say, well, you're the son of God. I'm sure you'll figure out about it. But it wasn't. His answer was this. 200 denarii worth of bread won't even be enough for each of them to live a little. Or to have a little, sorry. He thought in human terms. 200 denarii was probably what was in the treasury for the apostles. And he was thinking, how am I going to come up with an answer? It's not how you're going to come up with an answer. It's how you're going to be obedient and watch God work through you is the answer. Amen. Philip says, well, what we got won't even come close to give him a taste. Knowledge and working knowledge are two different things and spiritual tests through confidence bring that knowledge to where that you're willing to use it for faith you can read this all you want you can study it all you want but it's still just a book until you get it from here to here Amen. and when you get it to here it becomes a sword it becomes the tool necessary to be obedient to your God, to be successful in spiritual warfare. Amen. Your choice right now, you either own a book or you own a sword. Amen. Which do you have? Four things spiritual tests do to you. They permit us to suffer. I know this is unique in thinking, but suffering for your God is a good thing because you'll never forget the lesson that you went through. Acts 16, 23 through 25, we talked about it last week, not going into it again this week. Paul and Silas suffered. They suffered. And yet they sometimes... <clears throat> Paul suffered for his God. Job suffered for his God. Jesus suffered for the Father. Suffering is not a bad thing. It's no fun to go through. 
and it hurts when it's you. But if it's a spiritual test, you know what? God says that he won't put more on you than you, you bear. He says that he always has the exit door for you. He's telling you when you're going through that suffering, he's with you. When the three Hebrew children were bound and, and thrown into the fiery furnace and they decided to look to see what was going on, there was four in that fiery furnace. Amen. And when you go through your suffering, whatever it may be, if someone else is looking there, somebody's standing beside you. Amen. And that's Jesus. And when they came out of that fiery furnace, the only thing that was broken was the bonds that they had on. God is with us. Suffering hurts. But God has you. He's creating and molding you in your spiritual life. And he's with confidence taking the knowledge from here and placing it in here. So that you're a better person to serve him in real time for spiritual warfare. But you've got to learn to pass the tests. Oh, this one hurts me. Because I know personally of some folks that are going through it right now. And it kills me that they're going through it. So pay close attention. If this rings a bell for you today, and it brings someone to mind, tell them. Tell them what you learned today, or tell them to go to the video. Because it's necessary. The fifth truth. The spiritual tests permit temptation. They allow you to be sifted. Jesus said to Peter, watch out. Satan's asking permission to sift you, and I'm praying for you. Even if you're sifted, God's with you. Look at James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. King James Version, it says patience. But endurance, patience, must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Hold on to those verses for what I'm about to tell you. Testing of your faith produces endurance. You may go through a test more than once. If you fail, you're going to have to take that test again. God wants you to learn the lesson of the trial that he's given you. And he is your master. And until you learn that lesson, you're going to go through it again and again and again. I know right now, Two brothers in Christ who are living spiritual life, living Groundhog's Day. They can't get out of the cycle because they can't change the knowledge here to the working knowledge here through confidence and they can't pass the test. God is going to continue to test you. And James says that, God, that when you do these things, that you're going to get endurance or patience. Why? Because you've got to be able to use that faith on command when God requires it in real time. You need to be mature and you need to be complete, lacking nothing. You have to know what he's trying to teach you. And I don't mean no, I mean no. A working knowledge of it. You have to have the confidence that whenever this issue comes up, you will pass the test, you will prove it to yourself that your character is of God and you will walk out on faith when God requires it of you. But until you're willing to do that, God is going to keep testing you. And testing you. And every trial that you have to go through again is more two by four therapy. It's more beating on you. Remember, God allows us to suffer. Because that's the way we learn. And then you'll come up through this test again and you'll think, I was just here. I've had brothers and sisters in Christ say, I don't know what I'm doing, my walk. It seems like this just keeps coming up. It's coming up because you can't understand. 
that you've got to walk by faith. You've got to know it, a working knowledge of it. And you're not willing to do that. And I don't know what's in your way. It could be self. It could be just ignorance. It could be just, I just don't want to. It's just a denial to be obedient to the living God who, is, who has given you eternal life. Whatever the cause may be that is stopping you from having a working knowledge, from passing the test, so that you can be used by God. You don't get to move on. You get to endure. You get to suffer for your God until you get to the point that you can pass the test. Endurance is the ability to persevere through increasing levels of testing and suffering. Why is there increasing levels of testing and suffering? Because you just can't get it from here to here. You know, I preach from God's Word and I always use life examples because that's how I know these things. And I tell you that my life as a minister or my life of walking as for God in 44 years has been a rough walk. Has been treated terrible throughout the 44 years, but it's made me who I am today. I was willing to pass the tests and God put me here. Endurance indicates that further work must be done in your life for the purpose of making the believer mature and complete, lacking nothing. That's what a good teacher does. You get to take a makeup test. And another one. And another one. And if you don't get it that way, then God puts you through another trial that's close to the same trial that he was in. Your circle will continue until you're willing to be obedient, until you're willing to put a knee down for Jesus, until you're willing to sacrifice whatever God's called you to sacrifice, whether it be self or whatever it is, until you're willing to understand and have working knowledge, you will take the test again. Because you don't have a right not to mature. You don't have a right not to be complete, lacking nothing. You don't have a right to say, eh, I'm just not good at that, I'll do something else. That's not your call. That's God's call. Knowing God's word is our life. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Oh, well, that was a good amen. Let's recap, and I believe this is in your bulletin. I didn't get a bulletin below, but I believe it's in your bulletin. <clears throat> so that you have it. Spiritual tests teach us how to sacrifice. Why? Because it creates and proves our commitment to our God. Not to God, but to ourselves. You have to know by faith, by confidence, that when God calls you out to do it, that you're willing to do it in real time when God requires it. You've got to have the proof to know it. Second, spiritual test gives us opportunities to choose. In other words, you get to create your attitude. And attitude determines your direction. Spiritual test provides hard tasks for us to complete. Why? Because hard tasks teach us how to rely on God with confidence for the next step. Spiritual tests allow us to suffer. Why? Because it strengthens our faith. Lessons are learned when they are seared into our actions. When I was a kid and I touched a hot stove, never did it again. Doesn't let, mean I let my little sister learn her own lesson. It's good for her. 
Spiritual tests permit temptation because it produces endurances when you fail. And the reason that you need patience or endurance is because God is working a perfect work in you. Amen. He wants you to mature. You don't have a right not to mature. You don't have a right not to know more about God today than you did yesterday. I'm a lifetime student. Loving every minute of it. And all this that we're going through right now is new to me in this format. I don't know about you guys, but I've learned a lot about spiritual warfare when I'm willing to open up for it. It's something that makes us stronger in our abilities to serve. And producing endurance or patience gives us the ability to do it until we pass the test. And you will do it until you pass the test. Just out of curiosity, no names, no nothing required. Did that bring a picture of a brother and sister you know that is just going through a test over and over and over again because they just can't pass it? Yeah. Me too. Pray for them. Serving your God this year at Shining Light Baptist Church is learning. It's learning how to handle spiritual warfare in a mature way. It's learning how to be successful in spiritual warfare so that we are equipped and prepared for the harvest next year. Because once we step out into the harvest, Satan will be kicking with both feet. And we need to be able and mature enough to handle that. So that's why we went through fresh worship. That's why we went through the tests and the trials. Now, next week is an entryway into the next series. And the next series is David. We're going to talk about the life of David when it comes to spiritual warfare. It's going to be an amazing time. Bow your heads with me if you will. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or maybe you're here today, or you're watching my video, the Holy Spirit is calling you. He's telling you, you've got to get out of the rut of knowing who God is and accept the working knowledge of who God is. There are a lot of people that are going to hell that know who God is. Knowing with your mind who God is and believing that there is a God in your head is going to send you head to hell just as quick as it would send the, the biggest sinner, if you will. <clears throat> head knowledge will not accomplish what God has for you, a working knowledge through confidence in your heart. So if the Holy Spirit's talking to you today, I've got one question to ask you before we give the invitation. If you died today, do you believe that you have a working knowledge of a relationship with Jesus Christ that will take you to heaven? A heart knowledge, not a head knowledge. If you need to say this prayer, all you have to do is say it and mean it. You don't have to say it out loud. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm lost and I need you in my life. Replace my will with yours and I will follow you for an eternity. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. With every head still bowed and every eye stayed still closed. If you said that prayer through our video ministry, welcome to the family of God. We invite you to come to Shine Light Baptist Church. The address is on the screen. Tell us about that decision that you made so that we can help start you on your path as a disciple. Maybe you have a family church or a home church that you're more comfortable with, then we encourage you to go to that pastor and tell them about the choice that you made so that they can start you on your path as a disciple. If you're here today and you've said that prayer, just raise your head and look up at me. I want to ask you three questions. All right, maybe you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Then I'm going to encourage you to whatever the Holy Spirit's telling you about this series, to make it known to you, to get into your world. And create a heart knowledge, a working knowledge of the Word, and not just a head knowledge. Step out on faith. 
because God is calling you to, not because you see the end results. Deny self. Don't tell God what you want, but tell him you're available for what he wants. These are key elements in your walk. You are to mature as a Christian, to be lacking nothing. And the only way we do that is we pass these spiritual tests. So I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be praying that the Holy Spirit is on your hearts, that it's on your hearts to tell someone that isn't here, to take a look at the video so they can get caught up with it or give them a bulletin with the references. I know I've had several calls this morning, they're out with the flu. And I get it, I do. But I also know there's no such thing as coincidences. So they need to get caught up. They need to know that you care. They need to know what we're learning so that they can stay with us. Pray for them. But reach out to them, encourage them, say, hey, if nothing else, watch the video. The video ministry is a great ministry for that. It doesn't replace you sitting in this seat, but it is a secondary weapon against spiritual warfare. I hope that you're enjoying this so far, because we got a long way to go in knowing who you are in spiritual warfare. All right, raise your heads. Stand with us if you will. For the very good you understand the for lack of a need, but there is a need. So, Brother Alex, you got something to say? All right. Um, Come up. So, we'll start taking donations. Um, you can either donate whatever's on the list. I think they're handed out. and uh, Or we'll be taking money, but just make sure you mark it for holiday happiness. And uh, we'll be having it December 16th. It's the third Friday of December. And we'll start doing it then. So. so there is a special Friday night dinner on the 16th. That's the third Friday that uh, this, uh, the Nagis are doing for us. There is lists, Brother Richard, have them of what we're looking for for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We're looking to build a box that will feed folks for three days. Three breakfasts, three lunches, three dinners. Miss Sarah has painstakingly went through. She's created these lists. Hers is typed and nicer. Mine's handwritten, and that's what you're getting today. But Brother Richard has them. We're looking to fill 20 boxes on faith. Amen? Amen. Amen.